So uh, in the first hour of this morning, uh, we will be guided by Pablo Quiles in doing some exercises on uh, actions. And uh, Pablo uh, is a postdoc at DESI working on uh, flavor of physics and action physics, also in connection with cosmology. And uh, before uh, his postdoc, he got uh, his uh, PhD in Madrid. And so I don't uh, steal uh, further time. And uh, I think, Pablo, you can start if you wish. OK, so good morning to all of you. As Andrea said, I'm Pablo Quilez, and I'm going to be in charge of the first session of these exercises on actions. And OK, first of all, I want to say that I have already sent a link on the chat in which you can access to this document, in which you will have the, the first two exercises that I will cover in, in the first hour. Mm, so, of course, here you, you have my email. So if you have any questions regarding the exercises or also the lectures, feel free to, to contact me at any point. And also feel free to interrupt me in, in the meanwhile while I am explaining the, the So first of all, is there any question now regarding the lectures of Andreas, the first lectures, or should I start? I have a question regarding the link. You said you send the link, but... Ah, you cannot see the link? Okay, so good point. So let me share it again, right? Because it is... It, it, is, it is in the chat. In the chat. Maybe I, I sent it you again. You should open the chat. Do you have it now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, so... If there are no questions, let me start with the first exercises. In the first exercise in which I am going to focus on the axon coupling to photons. So as Andreas already explained, it is one of the most important couplings because a lot of experiments are trying to detect the axion using this coupling to, to the photons. And that's why it is important to understand what is the prediction that the different theoretical models give for this coupling. And in particular, Andreas already commented on the, on the lecture that the axon coupling to photons uh, has two different contributions. One that is this E over N that depends on the, on the specific model of axions that you're studying. And then there's another coupling, there's another contribution that is instead model independent, that is this 1.92, that that is, as I'm saying, this is model independent because it will depend on the, um, on the mixing of the axion with the neutral mesons. And in particular, what it is asked in this exercise is to compute this model independent contribution, right? And in order to do that, we have here some guidance as, so we will study the, the, the chiral Lagrangian with the pions and how the axon mixes with them. And then once we find the true physical axion eigenstate, we will see how the axion inherits part of the axon coupling of the pions and the eta prime. Okay, so, so before going, okay, let me, so exactly, so then, then the goal of, of this exercise is to compute this, this term that we have here, this correction to the axon coupling to photons. But before doing that, let me, let me review where do these different contributions come from, right? In particular, where does this other contribution come from in the case of the action? So if we are uh, at high energies, that means mu larger than lambda QCD, then we, Andreas already saw that the Lagrangian of the axion has this, this shape in terms of the interactions with, um, with the gauge fields. So here we have the coupling to FF dual, and then we also have the coupling to the GG dual, right? Because as, as, we ha, as Andreas commented, in order to solve the strong CP problem, we need the axion to coupling to couple to gluons, right? Then uh, it is common uh, to rewrite this kind of Lagrangian and define that whatever we have in here will be what we call FA, right? Then, okay, before, before going there, 
let me say that the, um, the origin of, this, of these two couplings, uh, this depends on the, on the action current. So we know that the action is a Goldstone boson, right? And therefore the action has either derivative couplings or anomalous couplings of this kind. And in particular, the anomalous couplings depend on the anomaly of the corresponding current. This means that one can compute the coupling of the action to photons by computing these so-called anomaly factors. In particular, the, the expression for these factors is the following. They depend on the, on the, on the fermionic representations that, that, that have Petzequin charts. And in particular, they, they correspond to this formula. So this coupling can be computed with the famous triangle diagram in which we have different fermions running in the loop. And therefore, in order to compute this electromagnetic anomaly, here one needs to put the Petzei queen charts of each of the fermions. And here we have the electromagnetic charts of each of the fermions. And by adding all the different fermions that are in the given UV theory, we can compute this electromagnetic anomaly coefficient. Similarly, one compute the, the coefficient n by computing the anomaly to gluons. So in this case, these were photons, right? And in this case, these are gluons. And, and this is similar, right? We have here the same thing, right? In which we, since it is chiral, we have left minus right. But here, instead of the charge, we'll have the dinking index of the representation of the fermions, okay? So at the end, this is nothing but something really analogous to the usual color factors that we compute in, in, in the in Feynman diagrams. In this case, if you want to compute this diagram, you will see that there will be a factor that will have this form. And these factors will tell us the coupling of the, of the axion to gluons and to photons uh, in the UV. Now, once we have E O and N, as I was telling you, it is common to define that N over FPQ, so this would be the other way around. So, so it's, it's common to, to define, so this is wrong. So it's common to define that FA equals FPQ over N. So if we re-express this, the coupling two photons in terms of this FA, what happens is that here we remove this FPQ, we put FA and then instead of E, we will have E over N, okay? And this is why here the axon coupling two photons depends on both the, the anomaly, uh, the electromagnetic anomaly and the color anomaly. Okay, so this is the first part of, of the axon coupling to photons. But now the exercise is asking us how to compute or to compute this other contribution, okay? And this other contribution, uh, as we will see, is model independent. So, um, as, as Andreas already explained in the lectures, uh, the action is a Goldstone boson, right? A pseudo Goldstone boson. So in principle, it would be massless. However, it is not massless because the symmetry is not exact. The symmetry is explicitly broken by the anomaly. In particular, it is broken by this GG dual term. And this is why this GG dual term will be responsible for the mass of the action. Um, in particular, one can use a uh, chiral Lagrangian techniques and in order to obtain the effective Lagrangian below lambda QCD. Because here, so below lambda QCD, we know that QCD will, will become non-perturbative and it is difficult to handle with this GG dual. As a consequence, it's useful to write the chiral Lagrangian. That is the one that I have written here. So as you can easily recognize here, you can see the, the usual pieces of the, um, of the, so here I mean, I write the, the mass terms or the potential terms for the neutral mesons, right? So here we have the pion and we have also the eta prime. And, and as you can see, we have the usual terms in, that depend on the mass of the up and the mass of the down. And then we have this extra term that is a consequence of the anomaly. 
So as you all know, the, the anomaly was the famous solution to the U1 axial problem, because the U1 axial was not actually a true symmetry because it is broken by the anomaly. Now, what happens if we introduce the axion? What happens is that now the anomaly breaks explicitly both the U1 generators and the pet sequence generators, the action. And as a consequence, once we take into account the, the, the full system with all the neutral mesons, there will be, there will be mixing between the action, the pion, and the eta prime um, that will modify the physical eigenstates. So now the first step in order to, to compute the, um, the, this modification to the action capital two photons is to obtain the mass matrix for this system, okay? So then what, what we can do is expand this cosine, right? And, and then if we expand this cosine for small uh, fields, we will remove this, we will remove this, and this will be squared, right? And with a minus. And now from here, we can easily uh, extract the mass matrix. Let me, oops. So from here, we can extract the mass matrix of, of the whole system, right? So now we're interested in the mass matrix of the system, of the, the pion, the, the eta prime, and the action, right? So, so first of all, here, we will have that for the pion, we will have the contribution B0, M up, plus M down, coming from here and from here. Then we will have the mixing that depends on the difference of M up minus M down. And here we have no mixing of pi three with the axion. Similarly, here we have B0, M up minus M down. Then for the, for the eta prime, we have two contributions, right? We will have one contribution from here that will be 4k over f pi squared plus the contribution that ha comes from the mass of the quarks, right? m up plus m down. And then finally, we have the mixings of the actions of with the, with the eta, right? That here will be 2k over f pi f a. And here, similarly, we have 2k over f pi f a. And here for the axion, we just have a squared with k, right? So here we will have k over f a squared. And here another zero. Okay. So now we have been able to, to construct the mass matrix for this system. And then the what that now the only thing that we need to do is to diagonalize the this this system in a given limit in a limit in which fa is way larger than k to the one fourth and way larger than b0, because we know that in the case of the actions, in order to evade all the experimental constraints, fa needs to be typically larger than 10 to the eight GBs. So therefore, this scale is way larger than any of the QCD scales. And moreover, we also know from the chiral Lagrangian, right, that these scales that depend on, on QCD are also way larger than M up and M down. Okay. So now the goal is to diagonalize this matrix that you can do using the method that you like best. You can do it with Mathematica, you can do it with, with Python, or you, or you can do it also analytically. But in particular, what I'm going to do is to, since we are just doing it in, in this given approximation, uh, we, can, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that, that it will be way easier than, than, gener than the general case. In particular, looking here at the Lagrangian, we see that the, um, at first order, if we go to this limit, we can neglect all these terms, right? And only remain with this term because this will be the largest because it's the only one that is not suppressed by, by the mass of the up and the down. So from this, we can see that one of the mass eigenstates will be nothing but this combination and will correspond to the eta prime. And therefore, one way of diagonalizing this matrix, or at least sending this, this problem of a three by three matrix to a two by two matrix, 
is to, to define this as the physical eta prime and then obtain the system of a two by two matrix. So let's do this. So since this, since this will be now equal to two and the eta prime physical over f pi, this means, let me go down here. So this means that we, we, we have recognized due to this hierarchy that this is uh, the largest scale for, for the masses. Um, this will mean that two eta prime physical over f pi is going to be equal to two eta zero over f pi plus a over f a. By the way, so now I realize that I'm calling it A all the time, but in this case, we should, we should be more careful and we should call it A hat because this is, let's say, the, the starting axiom, not the physical eigenstate. So from this, we can see that the, we can now uh, integrate out data prime in order to obtain a two by two system with these, with these mesons. And this means that we can substitute Everywhere, when we have the eta zero, we can substitute this minus one half a over f a, right? So now what we want to do is to substitute this and, and this will go to zero, right? If we, so this will go to zero because we integrate out this, this heavy field. This means that we're going to substitute this expression here and here. Okay, and in particular, the Lagrangian that, that we will get is the following. So we will get here this zero over two, right? And we will have now M up, we have the pi three over F pi as we had before, but now, now since we substitute here in the eta zero this expression and we put this to zero, what we are doing basically is introducing this axiom in here in this mass term. So therefore, this means that here we will have, so this is with, um, right, yeah. so we will have this, right? squared plus md and similarly we will have pi three plus one half a hat over fa squared right and now this is way easier right because now we just have a two by two system the, the matrix now two by two in which we only have the axiom and the um, and the and the neutral pion is nothing but this. And finally here we have one fourth of F pi, okay, sorry, here I'm missing F pi. F pi squared over F a squared and M up plus M down, okay? So now finally we have a two by two matrix that it is really easy to diagonalize. I, moreover, taking into account the fact that, that we still know that F a is way larger than B zero and um, and all the other scales be zero, f pi, et cetera, right? So then what we can see is that if we send f a to infinity, what happens is that all these terms will go away, right? And therefore we clearly see that in the limit f goes to infinity, the only mass eigenstate is this one here. That is nothing but the formula for the usual uh, neutral pion. This means that pi zero, a squared is nothing but B zero, M up plus M down. Okay. Now, if we want to obtain the mass of the axion, we need to go to next level in this, in this expansion over FA. And one thing that you can do, for example, is to compute the determinant of this matrix. And if you know the determinant and you know one of the mass eigenstates, 
it's really easy to obtain the other mass eigenstate, right? And if you do that, it is really easy to show that then the mass of the axion is nothing but m pi f pi over f a squared times m up m down over m up plus m down. Okay. Okay, so now we have the mass of the of the two eigenstates, right? But then what we are interested in in order to obtain this modification in the axon coupling to photons is to obtain the exact um, linear combination of the physical axion in terms of the starting pion and the starting eta, right? And in order to do so, the only thing that we have to do is obtain the eigenstates of this, uh, of this matrix, right? Um, in particular, since we know that the axion will be basically this a hat with some correction uh, of a small mixing of the pion and the and the eta prime uh, it is really easy to to get convinced that at the end the mixing this uh, this small linear combination of the this small admixture of, of the pion will be nothing but this of diagonal term over the mass so this is really easy to compute, so I leave it for you. But in particular, the, um, let me write the full result. That is that finally the, the, the physical action, right? That I will call a physical or, or directly A will be approximately equal to the starting action plus a mixing action pion, right? Times the pi three plus theta action eta prime times the eta eight. I'm sorry, the eta zero. It's the eta prime that one will be interesting. And in particular, if you if you compute this mixing, what you will obtain is the following. This is going to be equal to minus f pi over two f a m down minus m up over m up plus m down times pi three. And then in order to get the mixing with the eta prime, we see that it is nothing since it has to be the orthogonal com uh, 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 combination of, of this one. It's, it's really easy to convince ourselves that the mixing is nothing but f pi over two f a. So this will be minus f pi over two f a times eta zero. Okay, so now um, this means that the coupling that we were computing at the very beginning of the axion was only the coupling of this starting axion. That means that here I should have actually written, okay, in fact, I did a with a hat, but now, once we take into account that the action will mix with the pion and eta prime, the action will inherit part of this coupling that is this 1.92 that we had before. But then in order to, to compute the final coupling to, to, to photons, first we need to compute that this was the, I don't know if I wrote it here, uh, no. So this is, a, the, the third part of the of the exercise is to let me copy paste from here. Then now what we need to do is to compute what is the coupling of both the pion and the eta prime to, to photons, because this will be part of the coupling that the action will inherit, right? So in particular, let me copy this here. So now we want to compute. So what the exercise is asking is to construct the currents associated to, to the pi three and the eta prime, and then compute the their corresponding coupling to photons with this electromagnetic anomaly of the corresponding currents. So as as you all know, the 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 neutral pion, the the, the pi three, is the pseudo Goldstone boson associated to the, the following transformation. If we have UD, this transforms to E I sigma three over two gamma five 
UD, right? Um, where sigma three is nothing but one half minus one half, right? So now, since we know the transformation, it's really easy to compute the current corresponding to the to the neutral pion that is one half one gamma mu gamma five u minus d gamma mu gamma five d. Or in other words, this is nothing but q. If we define this to be q. This is Q, gamma mu, gamma five, sigma three, Q. So now we have the coupling, now we have the current associated to the, to the pion. And this is what we will define as our pion field, right? So this will be equal to F pi times D mu pi three. So from this current equation, we can compute the action coupling to photons. Why? Because we know that if we go to the limit m up, m down, go to zero, then at the classical level, d mu j mu pi three equals to zero, right? Because uh, in the in the classical limit and in the limit of massless quarks, this this um, this symmetry is exact, and therefore uh, it it corresponds to a conserved current. However, if we take into account quantum effects, we get an anomaly. And therefore, d mu j mu pi 3 will no longer be equal to 0, but will be equal to the anomaly alpha electromagnetic over 8 pi times this anomaly factor, right, that I'm going to call c pi times ff dual. So then in order to compute the, act, the, the pion coupling to, to photons, we just need to compute the corresponding anomaly factor of this current. And as I have shown you um, before, um, one, this is the equivalent of the, of the factor E that I was showing for the actions, right? And here for the pion, we have the, the usual anomaly factor. And this uh, can be computed analogously, right? And what we get is, okay, we have a factor of minus because of left minus right, a one half because of this, right? Then two because of left minus right, then three times color because we have three colors. And finally we have Q U squared minus Q down squared. And if you substitute here minus two thirds, sorry, two thirds and minus one third, you get that this anomaly factor is minus two. Now one can do this analogously to with the U1 axial current corresponding to the to the eta prime, right? So this current is nothing but Q prime gamma mu gamma five uh, sigma four, if you want, Q where you define sigma four as one half, one half, right? So the identity basically, but with this normalization. So analog analogously, if one computes the anomaly factor for the U1 axial, what, what one gets for the here for the eta prime is basically the same that we did here. So let me copy it for a second. So we yeah, we have exactly the same with the only difference that now since the um, with the only difference that since now we have plus one plus one this minus sign turns into plus sign and therefore one can compute that this is nothing by minus 10 over three so putting all this together, the conclusion that we get is that the coupling of the of the pion and the axi and the eta prime to photons is the following: we have alpha over eight pi, and then we have two that comes from here, pi three over f pi plus ten thirds of eta zero over f pi 
times FF dual. So with this now, we have finally all the ingredients. We have the coupling of the pion and the eta prime to photons. And we have also computed how the, the physical action depends on both the starting action, the pion, and the eta. So finally, if we put all this together, what we will get is that the final coupling of the action to photons will be equal to the starting coupling of the A hat to photons, right? Plus the mixing action pion times the coupling of the action, sorry, the coupling of the pion to photons plus theta, the mixing of the action to the eta prime times the coupling of the eta prime to photons. So now if one puts all the results together, what we get here is alpha over two pi fa. And we have E over N that came from here. And then once we put together these two different contributions, what you obtain is six, the charge of the down squared times M up plus the charge of the up squared times M down over M up plus M down. The, and in particular, all this thing turns into two thirds of M up plus four M down over M up plus M down. And if you substitute here the mass of the up and the mass of the down, what you obtain is that this is 2.03. So with this, we have finally computed what, what we wanted, right? What is the, the model independent contribution to the axon coupling due to the mixing with pions and photons? However, you can see that what, we, what I obtain here is 2 point something, whereas here I have written 1.92. The reason is that in this computation, I am just obtaining the leading order contribution. If you go to next to next to leading order, you can see that this formula that I saw before in terms of the masses of the up and the down has some corrections. And at the end, the full result, and in fact, the most updated result currently, the, the, the best estimation corresponds to this 1.92. Okay. So with this, we have solved the, um, the first exercise. But before going to the, the second exercise, let me tell you that um, here I have tried to show you um, a solution to the exercise that, that I think it has a better physical intuition because we see the mixing of the action with, with the pions and the eta prime. However, there's another method in order, in order to compute this, um, this coupling that does not rely on using, for example, the eta prime. Some people could have complained that actually in the in the in chiral perturbation theory, it's not so justified to, to, to include the eta prime, right? Because it's not a true Goldstone boson with a small mass. Um, however, in this case, in terms of computing the axon coupling to photons, it's perfectly fine, this approximation. However, if one needs to do this computation more rigorously and more importantly, in order to compute the next corrections, it is also possible to do it in, in a different way that you can see it explained, for example, in, in, this, in this paper that I write you here, 15110827. And, and let me so let me briefly tell you the, the outline of how to, to compute this in with this other method. So as, as we already commented, the starting Lagrangian is nothing but a Lagrangian in which we have the axion coupling to GG dual, right? Plus the axion coupling, but this is the axion hat, right? Plus this coupling to FF dual. 
Uh, and then on top of that, we have the quark masses, right? So here we have M of the quark, right? And Q. Well, this is nothing but M up, M down. So the problem comes that what we did was to substitute this GG dual term and effectively write in the chiral Lagrangian this term with the um, this term with the with the eta prime and the axiom. However, if we don't want to do that, another option is to to use a, a reparametrization of of the quarks in order to get rid of this term. In particular, what one can do is that again, if Q is up and down, one can make an action dependent rotation of the quarks. That means that we transform the quarks in the following way. With some arbitrary matrix QA. If we make this rotation that as you can see, this is nothing but an axial rotation in which instead of rotating one parameter, we are introducing here a field, the axion. If we make this rotation, uh, there will be two terms in the Lagrangian that we will that we get, will get modified. First of all, we will generate this term, an action GG dual term, because this rotation is anomalous. And then on top of that, we will also modify the, the mass term of the action, because the mass term breaks the breaks this, this symmetry, this transformation. This means that if I perform this rotation, what I can do is choose this QA so that the trace of QA equals one. And therefore, the, the transformation of the Lagrangian will get rid of this term. And therefore, the Lagrangian will be, we, we will no longer have an action coupling to gluons, but instead, we will have a different mass matrix that will be of the, um, of the following form. So we will have here Q bar, and here we'll have E I A over 2FA, Q A, M up, M down, and, and here E, okay, and comma five, right? And here I to, the same, right? So as you can see, by making this transformation, we got rid of the GG dual term, and therefore now we can do the chiral Lagrangian in a more natural way, with the only difference that instead of using the mass of the quarks, we will define all this matrix as MA, and this will be an action dependent a quark mass matrix. And therefore now what we can do is that in the usual chiral Lagrangian, what we would do is that we will introduce the trace of sigma MQ plus MQ sigma, where in sigma we have the, the pions, right? So this would be the usual case. So now we will do a modified chiral Lagrangian in which instead of putting here MQ, we will put this MA that we have defined that also involves the action. So here will be MA and here it will be MA. And, and in particular, if you, if you, if you use this, um, this Keira Lagrangian, you will, you will obtain uh, exactly the, um, whoops, sorry, you would obtain exactly this two by two Lagrangian that we obtained before by integrating our data prime. But then on top of that, since we made this rotation, this rotation is anomalous not only under QCD, but also under FF dual. And this means that the Lagrangian will get modified in here in the mass term of the pions, but also what we will get is that the here in the Lagrangian, what we will get is that also the coupling to photons gets modified. And what we get is the following.
So we have here the starting E over N, but computing the anomaly of this transformation, what you get is basically minus six trace of QA times Q squared, where Q, is, where Q is nothing but the, the charts of the up quark and the charts of the down quark. So then the bottom line is that if you do this in this way, you obtain exactly the same result. And here you can choose the, the, the matrix QA so that you automatically diagonalize the, this two by two matrix of the pion and, and the axiom. Okay, so, so anyhow, with any of these two methods, what one can do is to compute this axion coupling to, to photons. And, and as I was telling you, this is important because since the axion coupling to photons is one of the most heavily used in order to, to try to find the axion, it is important to know what, uh, what, what size of the coupling we expect given a, a specific model. And that's why it's important to understand the origin of, of this match. Okay, so now I'm going to go to the next exercise. So is there any question regarding the first exercise? Okay. So anyhow, if you if, I, if later on when you do it more calmly and you repeat the, the, the different steps, uh, feel free to write me a mail or whatever and I can help you out if you have any, any question. Okay, so once we have done this, let's go to, to the second problem. In the second problem, uh, uh, it's about the so-called Pacheco inequality problem. And in particular, what the problem is telling us is to consider that to the usual KSV set axiom that Andreas already explained, we introduce a new operator, which is this operator that, that we have here. This operator in which we have some power of the, um, of the complex field that, that contains the axion, this big phi to the n. And this is a higher dimensional operator that is suppressed by some power, some of n plan, right? That, that I'm assuming that this cutoff scale is n plan. Um, the first question that the problem is asking is whether this term breaks the Petzequin symmetry, right? So in order to know whether this breaks the pet sequence symmetry, the first thing that we need to, to see is how the axion transforms under a pet sequence transformation, right? So under a pet sequence transformation, the, this whole field transforms as e to the i q alpha phi, right? Because this has charge q. And in particular, in a specific models, you can choose this charge to be one, right? So from now on, we're going to assume that this charge is one. So what happens if I make this transformation to, to this operator that I have here? So this Lagrangian gets transformed in the following way. We will have C over M plan to the N minus four. And, and due to this transformation of the phi, what we will get here is e to the i q, okay, that we remove the q, e to the i n alpha times phi n. So as we can see here, if we perform this transformation in the field, then the operator does transform, it gets modified. And as a consequence, this term breaks the Petzequin symmetry. Okay, now you may wonder why do I care if this uh, term breaks the symmetry or not? The reason is for the following. Let me forget for a second about, about that breaking term. And, and let me consider the, the canonical action, the canonical Petzequin mechanism. So in the, um, in the Petzequin mechanism, the key in order to solve the strong CP problem is that the U1, is that the U1 Petzequin symmetry has two important properties. First of all, it needs to be classically conserved.
That means that the divergence of the Petsequin current needs to be zero at the classical level, right? So this means that no term in the Lagrangian can break the Petsequin symmetry, right? And then the, set the second important condition is that it needs to be anomalous under QCD. That means that actually the mu g mu needs to be proportional to the gg dual. So in the usual case, the only term that breaks, the only term in the Lagrangian that breaks the Petsequin symmetry is the famous axion coupling to gluons. And it is this axion coupling to gluons that is responsible for the potential of the axion. In particular, using these scalar Lagrangian techniques, one can compute that the potential for the axion that comes from, from this term has this, the following shape, as Andreas already write, wrote in the, in the lectures. So this is the so this is the potential for the axion. This is the potential of the axion. But what, why it is important the potential for the axion? What happens is that the reason why the the the, the axion is able to solve the strong CP problem is because the minimum of this potential corresponds to the CP conserving point. This means that even if I start with a Lagrangian that had a given theta parameter, the action, the minimum of the action will take a BEV such that the effective theta that will be all this combination is equal to zero. One can easily check that uh, the minimum of this potential corresponds to the point in which a over fa plus theta equal to zero. And therefore, the theta effective equals to zero, and we solve the strong CP problem, right? Actually, this is more general, right? This is not a property only of this potential, but can be shown in general with the buffer witten theory, right? But the, the conclusion is that the potential that the non-perturbative effects of QCD generate for the action is such that at the minimum, there will be no CP violation. And this is why the, the action solves the strong CP problem. However, what happens if now we introduce a new term? We introduce a new term of the kind that, that I'm showing here in, in, in this equation. If we add this new term, this will get this will generate a new contribution for the action potential. And therefore, the minimum of the potential will no longer correspond to the CP conserving minimum. And instead, it will be displaced with respect to, to this value. And this means that at low energies, we would expect a non-zero value of the theta parameter. And this is exactly what the what the exercise is asking, right? So here we, we have this, um, this operator that we're adding, and the exercise is asking, first of all, does the operator break the petsequence symmetry? And we have already said that, that yes, indeed, this operator breaks the petsequence symmetry. Then we need to compute the contribution to the potential and the, the predicted value for the effective theta parameter. So how do we do that? So taking into account here the, the expression of the, of the action, uh, sorry, of, of this complex field in terms of the action, one can, can easily compute that that term um, if we if you if we substitute as I was saying that 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 phi, sorry, whoops. If we substitute that this is basically F A times A I to the A over F A, we and we have if we have phi to the n, we will we have phi to the n, right? And then since we will have this plus Hermitian conjugate. 
the, the exponential will turn into a cosine. So then the final result is that Okay, by the way, here we have some factors of square root of two due to the fact that we also have the row and therefore the, the result is the following. And here we have this new contribution that goes as a cosine of n a over f a plus delta, where delta is, so here what I'm saying is that c equals to modulus of c times e to the i delta. So one can see that this is the contribution from the potential just by expanding this exponential and obtaining the, the cosine. So now when we combine these two terms of the potential, this one that we have here and the original one of the action, what we see is that now there will be two contributions, right? We have the usual QCD contribution that wants the, the whole effective theta to be in zero, but then we will have another contribution that has uh, a shift on the, on the minimum that this will be theta bar minus delta that we can call, let's say, delta prime. As a consequence of this new potential, then the total result will be somehow, the total minimum will be somehow in the minimum, in the, in the middle of, of, the two, of the two minimums. In particular, in particular, by, by making the derivative and minimizing the, the whole potential, one can compute that, that, this, um, that this small shift that we will get in the, in, the, the, in, the, in the effective theta parameter can be shown to be equal to C, FA to the N minus two over to n minus two minus one, n Planck n minus four times m a times sine of this delta prime that I have just defined. So then the conclusion that we're getting is that if we add this this new contribution to the um, if we add this new operator. To the, to the action, if we add this new operator to, the, to, the, to an action model, what we get is that the minimum of the potential is no longer in zero, and therefore we, ex we predict a finite value of the theta parameter. So now the question is that, is this small enough? Because from the, from the experiments of the neutron electric dipole moment, of the, of the electric dipolement of the neutron, we know that the theta parameter has to be smaller than 10 to the minus 10. This means that if I put uh, the usual numbers for the action scale, for example, of 10 to the 12 GBs, this means that in order for this operator to be compatible with the experiments, we need C to be smaller than 10 to the minus 55. And this is what some people call the Petsey queen quality problem. The conclusion that we're getting here is that if you add any operator that breaks the Petsey queen symmetry, such as the one that we are considering, then in order to solve the strong CP problem, this operator needs to have a, a really small coefficient. It needs to be almost zero. Otherwise, it will completely spoil the solution of, of the action. And, and, and this is why it is called the, the Pacheco inequality problem. In order for the action to solve the strong CP problem, we need the Pacheco in symmetry to have a really good quality, right? It cannot be broken by any other operator. Uh, in particular, uh, some people are interested in this kind of, of couplings because there are some, some arguments related also to the Swampland program that, that say that all global symmetries 
need to be explicitly broken. So some people say that the only possible way in order to make gravity compatible with, uh, with quantum mechanics is for all global symmetries to be explicitly broken by gravity. And that's why some people consider these kind of operators as, as, as possible dangerous operators that can spoil the solution to the strong CP problem. Um, okay, and let me just finish by saying that this is an active topic of research, right, in which a lot of people are trying to solve this specific inequality problem, either by constructing models in which these operators are somehow forbidden uh, uh, for until you, unless you have really high dimensionality, because by the way, something that I forgot to say is that this really so much stringent bound is only for the dimension of the operator. So this is only for n equal to five. If you have that the operator corresponds to n equal to 10, more or less, then you don't have such a strong bound and therefore you, you are fine even if this operator exists. Um, Okay, so as I was telling you, this is the so-called Pacheco inequality problem that in somehow the action solution is, is not so stable and I, I, with respect to these possible operators. However, there, there are plenty of solutions in, in the market. First of all, we don't know for sure whether we should expect this coefficient to be order one or, or exponentially suppressed. In fact, in some cases, we know that it can be exponentially suppressed and therefore it is perfectly natural to have this small value. But then on top of that, as I was telling you, some other people are, are uh, it is an active area of research to develop models in which the, the petit queen symmetry arises accidentally. And as a consequence, these operators are automatically forbidden as a consequence of other details of the UV theory. And this is quite natural because it will it could explain why this symmetry is so well protected and why the petit symmetry is there and allows to, to solve the strong city problem. So with this, I think I am done with my exercise. So is there any question regarding this second exercise? What about delta prime? Sorry? Can you hear me? What about delta prime? Could you repeat? Delta prime. Ah, okay. So I defined it here. So delta prime is the um, is the misalignment that you have between the minimum that the potential of QCD wants you to take and the potential that this new operator is given. So in particular, yeah, this is a really good question. So in particular, if, if for some reason, the, um, this pet sequin breaking operator has exactly the same phase as the, the theta parameter, that would mean that the two, the two potential will be perfectly aligned. That means they will have exactly the same minimum. And therefore, even if you have this operator, you don't spoil the strong CV problem because the minimum will still be corresponding to the CV conserving point. And indeed, this is, uh, so this is a good question because some people try to solve the, um, this specific inequality problem in this way by introducing potentials that are, for some reason, automatically aligned with the one of, of QCD. So does this answer your question? So the delta prime is the, the difference between the, the minimum of the potential that comes from QCD and the minimum of the potential that comes from this operator that came from the, this delta that is the phase of the, of the parameter that we started with in the operator. Yes, yes. Okay, thanks for the question. Are there any more questions? Okay, so I think it's only five past 11. So I think it's time for Anton to take over, right? I don't know if you want to make a break between the two sessions, so. Um, okay, maybe we can have a five minutes break between the two sessions, so that uh, uh, we can uh, 
take some rest and then we can start in, in five minutes or so at uh, 10 past 11, okay? Perfect. Okay, so I stop sharing so that I don't can do. Um, okay, thanks. Okay, so see you in five